Uh, yeah, it's. I know it's been a while since I've done one of these, but um, I just got out of watching uh, Knives Out by Ryan Johnson. That's the first time in a while I've actually wanted to talk about a movie. Yeah, I really enjoyed the hell out of this film. For those who don't know, it's a whodunit in the framing, I would say. Not necessarily the execution, but the framing of like a classical whodunit, like, you know, Agatha Christie, you know, Murder, She Wrote, you know, the classic whodunit, you know, you don't. This movie has so many twists and turns, and it is, it's definitely a, a love letter to the genre, and I... This is one of those movies that's incredibly hard to talk about because it is way spoilerific. It's not a movie you want to give away because it's so well crafted. This is, you know, the second Ryan Johnson film I've seen. The first being the movie that nobody dares talk about because the internet man babies get very upset. Yeah. Yeah, I wore this t-shirt for a reason. Bug off. It's a classical who done it in the sense of like it's a big family everyone has their reasons to off the, pa yeah, the patriarch turns up dead everyone has their you know everyone kind of has their reasons to off the old man and the wacky detective is there and not a not a not a police detective you know a, a consultant detective in the vein of like your sherlock holmes is your pro you know, he's, he's there too, cause you know, he has his he has his reasons, you know, to you know investigate. Then, cause he doesn't suspect this to be a apparent suicide. You know, that's the point of you know who done it was really a suicide, and how how stupid would they to have a who done it? But the cast, oh, so you got um, let's reel off the big names. So you got you know, Chris Evans. Yeah, uh, Captain America. He, he with with the hairstyle that really harkens back to not another teen movie. <laughs> Got Don Johnson. Probably the first time I've seen him in a movie for fucking god knows how long. I don't like Don Johnson as an actor particularly. So it's not like I watch his movies. Uh, but yeah, he was good in this. That's the all the actors in this did a incredibly good job. And who else was there? Jamie Lee Curtis. Great to see her in this. Uh, this this movie is full of people but I know I'm gonna get the name wrong and I can't check it on my phone because it's right in front of me but Anna de Anas she was Joy in Blade Runner 2049 I thought she actually really helped that movie along even though she wasn't the central character and this movie without giving too much away she is one of the main characters even though you wouldn't think it at first, and she propels this movie forward. It's a little one note. There's a gimmick with her character. She sells it so well. I guess it propels the story forward and it propels the narrative forward in such a really good way that it she just she just steals the show. She just really just steals the uh, Christopher Plummer playing the uh, the victim, the patriarch. I can't think of this. <laughs> Harvey Thornby. Uh, the family is the Thornbys, and I almost said Harrison Splimby, but that's someone else. Michael, was it Michael Shannon, who's plays one of the, uh, is the youngest son? At least he didn't sound like he was, had a load of marbles in his mouth when he talked, unlike he Man of Steel. Ricky Lindholm from, uh, Garfunkel and that's so I was like, ah, every single time she was on. She has a bit part in it, but she has, she's, she's barely in it, but when she's on, it's like, oh, I love her, I think she's gorgeous, and she's freaking funny. Tony Collette. She's damn. She was good in this. Everyone's damn good in this. Even like the uh, the kid parts. You know, there's the uh, the the grandson, the youngest grandson, who is constantly referred to as like the the alt right and Nazi, uh, who is always on his phone and seems to be like downloading very dubious content. And there's the uh, on the other family, the daughter, the granddaughter. Uh, and she's like the the SJW. <laughs> so this this all this freaking great tension and a little bit of social commentary, you know, the fact of like you know they do talk about like it, you know some of the modern politic and but it's never framed in a someone's right, someone's wrong because that's not the point. It's just the fact that these are just bickering families and their own. You know, there's the hippie daughter and then the straight lace one and. And you know, it, all the numerous 
tropey family affairs that come up in this. But one of the best characters is kind of the patriarch, because he's set up as the crime novel writer. You know, he's always in playing tricks and games, and that's one of the part of things. Even though Christopher Plummer's very, very prominent in the first half of the movie, where, of course, they're setting up, they're setting up the mystery and the who done it and all that stuff, so he's very much in there. And you can just see the, like, the head games going on, and he's brilliant. And you, the character is um, pretty much absent throughout the rest of the movie, but you kind of see the lingering presence of this patriarchal character who, who's kind of fucked this family up, and he's trying to make amends for it, and, and it all goes horribly wrong. This, the, it's very tropey, but that's kind of what you get from a whodunit. But of course, because it's also a mon, you know, it's not because it's modern day, but it's also you've seen Who Done It. You have to keep the twists coming. You are you great thing about a Who Done It, and this is where you can tell kind of who good Who Done It versus a bad Who Done It. A good Who Done It keeps you guessing, but still has to make sense. The plot still has to resolve itself. A bad Who Done It will telegraph the villain, or you know, it's that thing like you know, this is why I don't like some of the American ones I've seen where they kind of kind of tell you the murderer is like within the first fuck kind of five minutes and it's like uh they just try to and then it becomes the cat and mouse game and yeah that could be it's not good for a who done it and not in this style it has its place it's like you know uh csi you know uh you get three guest stars one of them's the victim one of them's the red herring one one of them's the killer you know that's just how that shit happened the cinematography i thought was brilliant in this i, I kept noticing it but not in a negative way because it just it was just interestingly shot and I think that's something I was looking out for because one of the things I liked about Last Jedi or oh, that movie I shouldn't talk about is I actually think it's probably one if not the best shot Star Wars movie they've ever made so just purely cinematically Johnson has a good eye for dealing with characters I think you know getting in close and using weird angles and just those nice subtle camera tricks, you know. How Daniel Craig's character, Blank, is introduced is done nice and subtly and very well. The cutting between the stories, between all the family members, establishing a timeline is done very, very smart. And it's well edited. This is an incredibly well edited film in regards to pacing and the story, the timeline, the plot, and all that, and it's one of those things where some of that kind of kills some of these movies, and not just these movies, you know, like a whodunit, but like movies in general, is when the audience gets more information than the characters, particularly the characters we're investigating, so you know more information, and you're kind of watching people trying to be competent, but are failing, because they're missing that one bit of information. Early TNG kind of suffer from this problem where the audience know more than the character, and the character is just trying to discover the information, but it just feels like because of arbitrary time reasons and pacing, you know, the, no one's supposed to know these things, and, you know, it's, you know, information's obfuscated until a certain time. It can be a little bit weary. The good thing is with this, it's one of those things where it's done in such a way that whilst you have information, there's still a big question mark over significant pieces. This is why I was talking about how the plot twists and turns in such really good ways. The one thing I like about this movie is you're constantly left thinking about what the real narrative is. There is a character that's set up to be, for lack of a better term, a lie detector. But the movie even establishes that that lie detector has the capability of not necessarily lying, but not being able to tell the whole truth, which is a great way to set up this plot convenience of the, the character that cannot lie, therefore everything they say is gospel, but also subverting it at the same time to say, this character we know can lie, all these cannot tell the truth, ha doesn't have to tell the whole truth, and it's brilliant, because we also kind of know some of these truths, and so it, it's a, it's a, it's a cat, it's um it's a whodunit and a cat and mouse, and it's so smart. This isn't a dumb film. It's not It's not a movie that's deliberately trying to make you think in many ways. You know, it, it does do the whole kind of cliched, aha, I'm going to reveal that bit of information at the end that you didn't think about. But it's kind of like a staple to who done it. 
but it gives you enough pieces along the way. This is going to be a great movie to go back on and see how they established everything that led up to the conclusion. It's in there and you kind of have to, you know, if you didn't spot it, it does help by re-establishing. In a good way, not in a really terrible way. I think one of the worst ones I've ever seen was a murder she wrote where there's a murder in something and at the murder scene there was a pen top that's not established. This is the only piece of it. Well, this is the only piece of evidence. There's no murder weapon. There's no blood evidence or any of the other stuff but she determined that the one guy was the murderer because he had a blue pen mark on his shirt because clearly even though the pen wasn't in his shirt pen that got knocked off the biro and then he was as he was moving things along the stuff of the, the pen got rubbed onto his shirt realistically one of the most circumstantial pieces of evidence but it was enough to get a confession it's not that it's not contrived like that no this movie doesn't cheap out like that I See, I'm trying to think of what I would rate this out as um, if I was on, like, Stephen's podcast. I'd, I'd give it a solid 9 at the very least. I'd probably give it a 10, actually. It's a, it's a really good film. I'm just not sure it's one of those movies that's going to hold up well on repeated play. As a film, as a crafted product, yeah, it's definitely an, at the bare minimum a 9. 9, nine out of 10. 9 out of 10. Yeah, fuck, I'll give it a 10. I'll give it a fucking 10 out of 10. This movie was brilliant. I think I was laughing more than anyone else because it it was funny. It was genuinely funny, but I felt like I was the only one laughing. So you know, it, was just, it was that experience where the, there was barely any audience. If there was more, it was, there was no audience, right? So I'd be laughing my ass off, like, really loud. But I was laughing my ass off throughout most of this, and most people were just dead quiet. I'm like going, is there something wrong with them or something wrong with me? There's just some genuinely funny moments in this. The old matriarch, the, uh, the mother of the... Thornby. She doesn't do much, but she's amazing at it. Every time she just comes on the screen, it's just like she's just it's the trope of like, you know, the the old like, the old hundred year old woman that doesn't do anything but of course has that one vital key piece of information. Once it's, you know, properly established. Just that again, it's a trope. But <laughs> just the it's just so dry and deadpan. I loved it. I loved it. Uh, again, I, I loved all the performances in this movie. I'm, sh I'm sure I'm probably forgetting. Like, uh, that's the that's the other good thing about this movie is that it's it takes the framing of you know the group of suspects in the one house trope, and most of the investigation, for lack of a better term, is on the property on this. And oh my god, the set decoration of this house is amazing. I would love to meet the guy who did this and just go okay so how much of this did we not see because it's one of those great set designs where there's like kooky shit everywhere i'm wondering how many nods to mystery novels and like magician stuff it's supposed to be like this weird house and there's a lot of you know implied um hidden doors like like the housekeeper is introduced you know, she's making breakfast and then she goes up one set of stairs and then also goes to another set of stairs and it's just that thing where the geography of the house is a bit weebly wobbly as well so it's like it, you almost get this like apart from maybe like the grand hall like the the main room well we got the beautiful like uh circular knife set up set up there's almost a feeling like cross claustrophobia with a lot of the sets and stuff like that because there's just so much stuff everywhere and everything is a bit cramped and like it's also you no know, it's not well except for like the, the grand hall it's not well lit it's a lot of like you know warm lighting and it's it's cozy and it's cramped and it's cluttered and i love it i love it you know if i if i ever had a mansion you know that's that's how I'd have my mansion. It would, you know, I would fill it full of weird, exoteric crap, and I would love to be in that in, in that house every day for the rest of my life, just to know that there's something fucking weird and wonderful everywhere. You know, I have no fucking plain walls. You know, I'd it would be, God, you know, it would be weird. I, I don't, I don't love it. It's just a great looking film. Except for like, you know, the modern day contrivances like mobile phones and stuff like that. This 
would almost have like an ageless quality to it. I mean, it it, 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 it does scream modern in regards to you know everyone's driving, driving modern cars and stuff like that. Because there's this one thing where people say now like you can't, you can't do a lot of mo you can't do certain things in one day because like you know like a horror film because everyone's got a mobile phone now. So how do you deal with that? The idea of like committing a crime and getting away with a crime when everyone's got a mobile phone so you know you gotta you know people have more access to on the spot information or cameras or you know they can they can call whatever you want actually there's one really great aesthetic touch because Anna who plays Thromby's nurse Marta she, again one of the central characters her phone because she's not part of the family she's the hired nurse everyone else is dressed you know, extravagantly or they're wearing nice suits or, and she's always wearing like really down and humble because she's uh, she's uh, an immigrant and that does come into like the drama of the, the, the movie because uh, her mother is an un undocumented migrant so you never it's never really established how much she's been paid by Thromby, but the family takes care of her. She's being paid to wage, but obviously it's enough to keep her and her family going. She's not dressed extravagantly. She's always you know, wearing like woolen sweaters and stuff like this. She's very subdued compared to the rest of the family. And she her phone is broken. Like the phone, the screen is always is cracked. It's got plenty of cracked. We should sell this idea that she's not someone who's made of money and, you know, she's of low means. So she has to have her phone and she's always got a, a, it's it's still an iPhone. It's probably an older model, but it's cracked and it's, you know, well used. And everyone else has like the newer phones and the newer jewelry and the newer watches and this, this. It's just those touches where it's like, it just tells you everything about this character. This is what I mean when I say, I think Ryan Johnson is a phenomenal filmmaker because the you know, cinematography and all that, the small touches are brilliant. Love that. My probably one criticism is maybe it's a little bit too long. It's it's one of those issues with me when I think hey, I think maybe it went a little bit too long, but I, I have I can't see where there's any fat to trim. There really is no extraneous scenes. Maybe one or two bits could be do, but they kind of also do set up some of the tension the drama so I don't know how you could have done that in any other way or at least how they could have done it in any, any other way yeah so the pacing was still really good if you're a fan of the genre watch it definitely watch it if you love a good whodunit watch this movie you'll probably really enjoy it if you want to see just see some brilliant acting and some great just great filmmaking watch this film yeah I think I'm definitely going to get a copy of this when it comes out uh I might get it on 4K or Ultra HD, whatever it's called. Because I would love to go in and check out some of the screen by screens and see some of what's going on in the background and stuff. See if there's any Easter eggs because it's, it's just a visually just. I, yeah, that's the thing. It's a visually busy film with all this interesting, but you can still follow the action. You can still follow the characters, and there's no there's no visual slurry to it. I must admit, I'm, I'm so happy to see a movie that's just not full of grey as a colour. Certain film directors have started that. Like, if you look at my image right now, and it was like, you know, how this is actually nice and colourful. It's like, you can see pinks, and it's just not shades of grey and tin. There's only one time where it felt it, the, the temporal editing was a bit off, and that was about, what, so about the start of the second act. It's like, after they've kind of established the first big twist, and... You almost don't know the footage you're watching is set back in the past or concurrent. I found a problem. Martha's clothes were almost identical. The hair is up in the scene where the the night of the thing and the hair is down. And it's like the only really visual cue, but it's like the two the two like temporal editings were all roughly in the same location, so it was a little bit. Hang on, is this a flashback or is this a thing? And to the point where I almost lost a little bit of information that came back later on, but they do refer to it, which is, again, good. They actually, you know, not just go, ha-ha, that's the reason why, but they do kind of refer back to it. It's like, oh, that scene. It, it, 
it wasn't a big deal, but it was a, it was a, the one, the one time in the mo movie I got muddled a little bit, but it, it's fine, it's, it's fine, it worked, it, it's fine. Yeah, watch, go watch uh, Knives Out, it, I'd say just go watch Knives Out, it's probably not going to be in the cinemas for too long, it's definitely worth a watch. Again, it might not hold up for multiple screens, but I'm, I would love to watch this again, I, I would like going watching this again uh, in the cinema. It doesn't have the scale and the bombasty of most Bollywood blockbusters, but it's just a really good film, and it, it probably deserves to do a lot better box office, but the reviews have been really good, and I can see why. Uh, Aaron just knocks it out of the park. It's, it's probably one of the best films I've seen all year. Hit the thing, and the thing, and all the crappy shit that nobody does down there. Fuck it, whatever. I'm done. See ya.